Tony Beauvais. Welcome to this week's episode of Art V. On today's program, we will chat with controversial artist Peter Lease has worked as a stills photographer on major motion pictures in the USA, Europe and Australia. And he joins us today to talk primarily about his photographic career over the years. G'day, Pete. Thanks for coming in. Good to see you, Tony. Yeah, you too. Been mm. a while over COVID. Haven't been able. It's been a while. Yeah. Mm. Now, you studied photography and filmmaking in Paran at CAE 19... early 70s? Uh, 1970-71, Paran College of Art and Design. Yeah, it was a four-year course, photography and filmmaking. I went there primarily because I had a filmmaking course. But I did um, want to do photography. I sort of kind of got into it. I was primarily... Uh, painter when I was younger. Everyone thought I'd be into painting. Right. But um, I liked photography because it was somehow, what I wanted to do was I wanted to learn how to see better. I wanted to be able to look at things better and understand it better. And I thought photography was such a vibrant sort of medium that you can do that. But primarily I wanted to do film. But it wasn't exactly a film course at that time. It was mm. kind of, but I managed to um, get them to uh, let me make a film. So right. I did one there, yeah, on the first year. Mm. Oh, okay. No, well, I noticed that also you've done um, some series of uh, interviews about the times back. I did a few for three triple R. I had the tapes uh, of the interviews, so I thought during COVID, I made a couple of uh, movies out of those radio interviews and yeah. illustrated it with images, whatever I was talking about at the time. So I've done a bit of that. So just something to, you know, just exercise during the sure. um, COVID period. I'll get back to the body of work, but you've ended up lecturing in photography and filmmaking as well at RMIT and mm. CAE in the city, haven't you? CAE I did for a number of years and by the end of it I had a, you know six, seven classes um, per year on yeah. different aspects. Some was just the art appreciation of photography, some were more technical, some were more beginners, so it was that sure. kind of thing. And RMIT was pretty much talking about my own work and then that was filmmaking primarily and we had a small budget where I took a number of students and we made a film we wrote a script we went through the whole process of yeah. how you do it and at a limited budget and we made yeah. we made films so that was that course at RMIT primarily and in 74 with the photography you got the cover shot for it's new photography Australia That's right. and uh, to my surprise I had been traveling for a couple of years and I came back and went into a bookshop and I saw my photograph there I had no idea that it was the cover. That set you up and give you a bit of confidence because you shortly a few years later came out with Urban Labyrinth which was the series. Yeah well that was my first exhibition at Brummel's Gallery and that was an interesting premise because Rennie Ellis was organizing that at one time. Right. He didn't quite understand the Urban Labyrinth uh, theme and then he changed the title and I don't know why he changed it. He said, uh, I, I think it's more accessible to call it um, looking at our friends. And I said, well, well, I don't quite understand, but it was, I was pretty young and I did an exhibit before and yeah. I thought, oh, okay, you know, but um, I had to rectify that and in the in the and future as far yeah, because as what it, that was and make yeah. sure something like that didn't happen in the next show but well yeah but urban labyrinth is really my basic theme that i've done in a number of exhibitions and yeah. i've reproduced the urban labyrinth theme in a little short film but i also did uh two other series of stills on that theme later on in the no late 90s and early right. 2000s. Okay, you kept so. returning to the Yeah, original the Urban work. Labyrinth yeah, is yeah. an interesting theme because it's always evolving, it's always changing, it's becoming more commercial. Well, so you, that, you, yeah. I mean, you've even gone the degree of making uh, the short about the short film, but also mm. a book. That's right, I did a so book on the... You've done quite a few books. Yeah. Uh, 13 books, one is a two-volume uh, yeah. series, but mm. um, I've done 12 different series that I have exhibited over the years and made them into book form. Six months, seven months went by very quickly. Productive, and, um, productive, good time to catch up. Yeah, I couldn't do anything else, oh, you know, true. so yeah. um, it was an ideal time. And they're only, they're, they're self-published books. Beauty of this is that I can actually look at my work again and, and mm. see what the work was and, yeah. and I can even improve on it by a director's cut. And, and easy access because you're looking at a print instead of a computer screen which isn't as personalised. Yeah. Now the second exhibition 
did you return to the same gallery? Well, the photographer's gallery was the main one that I exhibited. I think I exhibited there about six times, but Brummel's yeah. I had exhibited three or four times. That's and right. Fad Gallery I had exhibited, which is always quite good. Yes. It was always a profitable um, venue as far sure. as uh, independent artists going. Now, the Metropolis series, that's one that stood out to me. What year was that? Well, that was 79 to 82, and that was the last book I did. And what was interesting was that they were uh, six by seven negatives, 120 films, so the quality is uh, a lot more uh, enhanced. But it was what was nice about working on that one again, I re it was an exhibition that was m exhibited maybe more than the other exhibition. I had an exhibition at Nagasai Gallery in Tokyo. You talk about a gallery that supports you. They yeah. paid for my accommodation. Wow. They got me fantastic huh? accommodation. <laughs> Every day I came to the gallery, they had an artist take me out to lunch. Oh. If anything wow. got sold the next day, I would be handed the cash. It was the Japanese are just now, super efficient. Well, I think we should bring that, in, bring that sort of stuff into the Australian Ooh, art market. It would be nice to have that influence <laughs> here. Yeah. But that was the 80s. It's a different it's situation true. now. idea of, because based on just the photography which you did carry on uh, doing for celebrity shots um, when you went to New York yeah that was one of the first uh, you were earning uh, some money yeah. doing some yeah, but it time. certainly helped you because you are oh, over there you were getting back into film theater TV d That's acting right. yeah. uh, and getting plenty of work so it introduced you to a few people in the motion picture industry. Yeah, and I did a lot of stills, uh, still photography. And, and you did film. for major motion pictures in US, Europe, and, and Australia. And Australia. Of course, yeah. because mm. uh, we'll get to that. That one, The first one, 1991. Well, that was the second one, Eberhard. Isabel Eberhardt. That was yes. shot in Paris and Tunisia. That was uh, in Pringle film. A little bit of a disaster, but the film was great to work on because it had Peter O'Toole, and I really yeah. enjoyed uh, yeah. chatting with him for hours while he was waiting for a take. Absolutely. And, but it had a lot of problems, that film. But it was, it was a fun period. It was great. But it opened doors because in 1992, um, Ian Pringle, the producer of Romper Stomper. Romper Stomper, that's right. Yeah. You were on set to be the stills photographer for that production. Yeah, well, I was living in New York and he asked me if I'd do it. And I said, well, if I can have com copyright, because I'd like to work on this, because this is something I could exhibit. Because when I did the shots, I printed everything. I developed everything while the filming was going. I was on the set every day. And then I had two weeks at the end to print. So I made three sets. And I made one, which I have a complete set. And then there was another one that I sold at Christie's, 2001. And then there was another one where I just sold off singly, you know, people buying them. Bad timing, though, for the Christie's auction in New York. Was it that 9-11? It was 9-11 was two weeks just before. It's so just, there was no one it, at the it, auction. It's no. uh, one of those macro fact is you can't control <laughs> externals yeah. so well, well, didn't see that coming bit of it no yeah but well like, i'd organized it well before that before yeah. that happened but um well, it did you, sell no. a few few weeks later other than um christie's you know having sold a piece there the you've got other work which is represented in um, the bibliothèque nationale 
uh, collection in Paris, haven't you? Well, when I left Australia, Rennie Allers told me I should uh, meet up with them, and um, so I took, yeah. I don't know, 20 images, and yeah. uh, the idea is they buy half, and then they, you donate another half, so you kind of get them. It's, right. And so I think they took about 15 images. And Close up a little bit about your film mm -hmm. stuff, but I've just got to mention that because you were working in collaboration with Ian Pringle, mm -hmm. uh, Romper Stomper, that that led to you making your first two, uh, you made some short films, mm. but you made your first two features. Well, we did with Ian Pringle, yeah, uh, yeah. Cartog Cartographer and the Waitress and Flights. They were, that's we right. made Flights and then we made... 79? Uh, 78, 79, that's yep, right, yep. yeah. Cartographer and the Waiter was funded uh, and we had a little bit more money to shoot that and so there were the two films and then after that I went to live in New York and then Ian continued and made a couple of nice films. Given the amount of uh, content you've gotten in regarding to the, the, the film work that you have produced in the, the shorts and the features, uh, love you to have you back next year on a regular basis to um, you know, talk us through some of the projects that you've put together over the years because it's uh, a, a fabulous stuff, uh, love for uh, people to be able to um, have access to view it because um, you've got so much going on in film uh, it, there's a lot there's a lot you can offer and especially advice for people you know starting out how to how to make it because sure. you've done it so back to photography only the strong that was another film that you worked on yeah that was another hollywood film uh, shot in florida which is kind of like a sir with love but uh with caboera you know the self-defense dance yeah. thing and uh, but it's kind of on that format of sir with love but that was a big film that was the, you know that paid well and it was you know plenty of uh, freedom to do a lot of things interesting shoot too so throughout your career um just to wrap up who or what has been the most inspirational factor in your working career as an independent mm. you know, you're an mm. actor, writer, filmmaker, photographer? Uh, you know, I mean, we'll go into the theatre stuff when you started Wax Theatres in Unseen in another episode. So, uh, has there been, you know, core? Well, there's a lot of influences, I think. You know, in photography, I mean, there's dozens of people, but uh, William Eggleston, I think, is one of my favorite uh, photographers. He's, he's quite interesting. Um, a photographer that Ansel Adams couldn't believe that was exhibited at the museum and whatnot. William Eggleston is pretty much guide to, you know, contemporary photography. You know, literature influences me, I find, because I tend to do a lot of sequencing, and I, I like the whole narrative uh, arrangement with films, so I have a tendency to do a lot of series. Mm -hmm. So literature um, has that element of, you know, a story. You know. Sure. So I think, you know, Kafka is my, was probably my most influential artist I could think of. I think that we'll probably have our own uh, special episode for the Kafka work you've done. We'll Actually, see how we go next year. Well, they've got a little couple of little movies. Yeah, yeah. Fun yeah. movies. That's know. right. Um, okay. Pete, again, thanks so much for coming in and mm. thanks so much for contributing some content. Um, you know, 20 artists out there who want to get involved. show you a clip now 
Urban Labyrinth, which mm. was the original series, your first uh, photographic series in 1974, which you've turned into about a three-minute short. That's right, but the, but the film is a little a later from the, that first exhibition. And you have described this work as a rapid narrative through our city, or any city, and a journey into the manic mosaic of the mechanical assault, identification and belief. Yeah. So, <laughs> hey, let's cut to Urban Labyrinth, check it out. the end of our 13th episode for series one of Art Beat. Just like to take a moment to send a massive thanks to all of the artists who got involved, all of the galleries that supported us, all of the people that got involved to give some content and promote art, and especially to all the viewers that took the time to um, check out and, and have a look at our brand new show. It's been a real pleasure to promote the totally unique and unifying subject matter of art itself especially over recent hard times. We'll be working hard to improve Art V for its second series return in 2021. In the meantime, keep an eye out for our summer series of programs. We've got some really great shows planned to keep you entertained and informed about the business of the arts. Well, that's all for now. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can shoot us an email at ideas at studioemedia.com.au. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you in the summer.